I uh, I watched my beloved Arsenal team get beaten by Barcelona many times. <laughs> <laughs> As do we all, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it goes. So um, I wanted to firstly say, um, I've now had the privilege of watching your film, Sound of Violence, several times. Oh, and so you, you, you've spotted every Easter egg, I hope. No, not every Easter egg, but I, I definitely <laughs> got the chopping mall Easter eggs, but I thought it would be cheating to, you know, say, oh, I know where, yeah, no, I wasn't going to do that. But, um, <laughs> but I did want to uh, say, I really love every time I watch it, um, there are so many brilliant passages in terms of the use of color. And I wondered Thank if you. you could talk a little bit about how you made that decision um, and, and how you worked on how you were going to portray synesthesia within the film, given that it's about a woman's experience of sound. I, I, I mean, the fact is I'm, I'm, um, I'm not really into desaturated looks for horror, you know, making it look very grim. And I like, I like color. I like to have a vivid space. And especially here when this is the story of an artist rather than a conventional serial killer, I wanted the whole vibrancy of the film to be felt. Um, and that's even before we even um, considered synesthesia. It was really an idea of, of creating um, a, in, I didn't want to have a drab sort of environment. This is Los Angeles. It's very sort of um, colorful and vibrant. And, um, and I didn't want to lose that. And many, uh, and many sort of colors and grades uh, that I've considered um, when I was setting out the look for this film uh, were definitely always going towards more, the more vivid rather than, than drab. Um, drab is not the right word, desaturated. Uh, but um, then um, synesthesia came from um, a discussion about how do we address Alexi's motivation? How do we address her experience? How do we address the fact that every time she hears the sound, it cuts away, it disconnects her from what she's actually doing. It disconnects her from the world. Um, so, um, you know, when we when we started to explore synesthesia as a way to 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 discover um, or to represent that, it, it first of all, like everything, and as you know, as we've discussed a few times, everything in this movie has been researched, and um, and uh, this one was a was a very fun research to do because. Synesthesia is, is less an ability and more of a, uh, sorry, less of a condition and more of an ability. And uh, it's something that is just an extra sensorial experience of, of, of sounds or, and, um, and really I could, I could create something that was quite akin to her own. Every, every person's synesthesia is different. Um, so um, my first uh, thought were when I, when it came to the idea of manifesting uh, lights and color were um, Northern lights, because I'm, obviously half Finnish and I, that's maybe where my references come from. And so we started to, and in my, in, in the script, I started to refer them to as Aurora Borealis and, and Northern Lights and real that, that sort of really explore. But then I felt it was too, you know, when described like that, we know that it's too much just blue and green. And I wanted something a little bit more Technicolor. So I, uh, we, we, we had fun with it. And we started to look at, at, um, at a system of, of lights that were that were not also there's a big movement as well in movies to use pink and blue, and uh, and so while we had those because they they do look great on screen and that's the main reason you know you have when you use too much red or too much green um, you have different uh, reasons why pink and blue are optimal but we I just really wanted to go as far as I could so we created the system where we would create the color both uh, practically and then on digital enhancements so. We would map uh, with Daphne, my amazing cinematographer and her amazing lighting and camera team. We created this system where we could light from the back to the front, um, even subtly, but just to have a sense of movement of lights. And we had um, obviously stands and lights, but then we also had tubes that we could program the colors for. And so we could literally have, have, have light projected onto Jasmine um, as she experiences it. Uh, which helped her, you know, being in the mood, you know, having that, I would literally be uh, sometimes 
I'd be the one uh, with the tubes and I'd be in front of her literally dancing with those giant the tubes. Gemini tubes just going. Yeah. Changing colors and going like this and really having a sense. And then, you know, again, because we were looking for, um, you know, a, a colorful, um, vibrant uh, environment, we, we didn't um, we didn't tone that down in the way we shot it and we really made the most out of it. So then when we lined up the, the, the digital enhancement to really have, a, have the, the part that really kind of floats around her, we had already lights around her per se, like practically there. And the reflection on her made it feel um, really immersive and, and really with the idea that she needed to feel like cocooned inside um, her synesthetic uh, experiences uh, during the murders, which also disconnect her from the rampage she's causing. Wow, I, you know, and and that's this other element that you know when the murders are happening. One of the inspirations that you've talked about a lot in uh, almost every interview I've read that you've done um, talks a little bit about giallo and the experience of color and heightened sensitivity within giallo films. And I feel like, um, there are specific scenes within Sound of Violence that certainly play that to, you know, its most extreme effect. I, I think particularly of the harp scene. Yeah, scene. the gallery, we, we, we felt it, we felt the giallo, um, it's very Stendhal syndrome meets, you know, Burgess yeah, and we're filming it slightly lower, having an art gallery and <laughs> <laughs> and the contrast, you know, you, you have those white walls with those very popping colors of the art, the artworks from uh, from the artist Adam Mars. And um, and, you know, we also the way we film it, we film it, you know, looking up and we have we, we're ne we're never in the sort of. Yeah, I, I, I mean. I, I wanted that scene to feel very Suspiria-esque and then just I felt I felt that like uh, I mean even like in various great movies that have used color in a vibrant way I feel I felt very empowered by movies like Bliss or Assassination Nation and you know the sense of 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 being able to really immerse with colors that don't seem always likely to be there but making them somehow fit in there and again this is one of the great thing about um when i met uh with daphne keen Wu, my my cinematographer um what attracted me to her work was that in few of her work she had those points of colors in the setup that were that were naturally there and they were never sort of popping out of place they were just there and, and it could be just and i thought that like she understood space and color in a way that we could really create that that environment and so as well when we when we have scenes like the like like, like the gallery and it just it it feels naturally giallo-esque we had by then this sort of dynamic where we're like we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna make the most out of everything that contrast and this is actually why um you know the harpist in dress is in black and then next to her there's this big red painting and then behind you have like blues and yellows and everything. And it's just, we just wanted to create an, an atmosphere um, that we, we, we constantly try to bridge um, the experience that Alexis is having and the reality she lives in. But, and sometimes it's also, it needs to be, to look unconsciously connected, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think the gallery is, the, is a great example of, of, of that. I mean, frankly, the studio as well, um, the music studio has, has a lot of warm tones, a lot of old woods and, and things like that. So that, that's as well, um, that was very, that allowed us to warm up the space. And when we had the synesthesia in the middle of it, it just kind of gave us a great, great platform. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, color has, has been a constant um, subject of experimentation uh, in this film. Yeah. And then when you put that together with the way that you explore sound as a concept throughout uh, your works, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about where the original conception for the short came from that then became the film and where that sits within all of your works as a whole. I know that's a very broad question, but I, I, I'm very- No, but it, it's, it, this is the thing is like, there, there, there's, a, there's a weird logic to, to my madness in a way. There's like, I, I, um, 
you know, um, rewinding, I, I, you know, I started off, I mean, I'm not, I'm going to actually go even perhaps further back than, than I normally go on a, on a, on the idea of where it came from. I'm the son of an artist. So my infinite, my affinity to art was, I grew up in artists, workshops and galleries and museums and stuff like that. So I, I, I was kind of always kind of kind of enthralled in this and then also interacting with many other artists and such. So then when I, when I started to, to, um, to, when I started my production company, my first incline when we started to do original things was just talk to artists. So my first documentaries were um, my first, my very first original piece was with Julian Schnabel and then followed with Peter Halley. And then we did a feature called New York Influence City um, about the New York art scene. And then that led me to a documentary, arguably the peak of my documentary career called 808, which is about the 808 drum machine. And so, but we are interacting again with artists telling us their relationship to this fantastic drum machine that changed the sound of hip hop and everything in the world. And so we spoke to the Beastie Boys, to Pharrell Williams, to Phil Collins, to Questlove. I mean, it was incredible, but it took over five years of my life. And I was immersed in this sort of constant um, dialogue about, about uh, you know, musical artistry and then around this drum machine. And I was very obsessed with this drum machine. And at the end of this very long process from the moment the start to the moment it came out, it was five years. Um, and I was exhausted and I couldn't even fathom. I had given so much to this documentary that I couldn't fathom making another one. And this is when my amazing wife uh, looked at me and said, it's time for you to do what you've always loved, horror. And I was, I was, you know, obviously, I as soon as I hear horror, I'm like, I'm very giddy, um, and uh, and I, I explored and I explored and uh, amidst of a few projects I was developing at the time, I had a um, light bulb moment of um, I need to kill somebody with a drum machine. Yeah, what is <laughs> a, a drum logical... machine? But it kills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's like okay, well, this is a perfect transition between that last you know, labor of love to a new one is that going from drum machine to drum machine was very different um, purpose. But then in the midst of that, I created the character of Alexis and the short um, toured festivals and got the, a lot of response and got me a lot of questions about Alexis, about who she is, her motivation and what she wants. And so um, I felt that it was the journey could not end there as far as this journey. And although the short really inspired Sound of Violence, it's not in Sound of Violence. There's a disconnect mm -hmm. between both. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I, uh, I got to journey on with a character and develop everything from um, the backstory that I had already written, but that I got to flesh out all the way to her artistic journey onwards. Um, and so... It really is a sum of my parts, and um, and it fits in my in my in my work with um, a lot of the a lot of, a lot of what I do tends to try to capitalize on what I know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, also you know I grew up surrounded by powerful and inspiring women, so obviously making female led stories seems to to come naturally. <laughs> I, everything I write seems to be female led, so I just. You know, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, my whether it's my mom, uh, my wife, or my two daughters, um, I hope they're very proud of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's going to, you know, continue onwards, maybe less with music, but um, but with other parts of my life that uh, that I tend to capitalize on. I mean, I'm working right now on a movie that that uh, taps into my Nordic origins. So there you go. It's, uh, it's always needs nice to feel a little familiar to me. Yeah. Does, does that also tap into the theme of artistry as well? Actually, no, this time it's not. This this one is more uh, this one is more paranormal, which is uh, something I, I didn't think I would necessarily uh, delve into. But uh, I uh, inspiration came and um, it's more about my relationship with uh, nature. I actually, I had written um, uh, an eco thriller that was due to be made. Uh, I was due to shoot it actually in 2017. And then like everything uh, tends to happen in this movie, things changed. And I went on to do Conductor. I, it's when I got the, the news that it was delayed that I got the light bulb for Conductor. And uh, But here, this new story is like, it's more uh, paranormal. And uh, But uh, yeah, immersed in what I, in everything I love about uh, the Nordic region. Mm. And, and I wonder also, given that Finland has opened up in such an amazing way for filmmakers as well, with all of the various credits and the very welcoming nature of 
everything that Finland is doing right now, I would imagine that makes it extraordinarily appealing to go and film there as well. I hope so. I mean, you know, we are, we're at a stage of development where we're hoping now to entice finance and I'm hoping that people respond, respond well to the idea of Finland. I'm a, I'm obviously a great uh, partisan of uh, shooting in Finland because of being a Finn, but also, you know, actually in 2017, I spoke at South by Southwest about the fact that Finland is an ideal setup for um, a horror movie it is. and that not enough horror movies are being made there. Um, it's uh, we have many things that are very peculiar about uh, the people and the place. And uh, and yeah, I'm uh, what I'm planning to do has not been done before. And I'm very happy about it. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because we know that a lot of people associate now the Nordic with Midsommar. But uh, yeah. and Midsommar is a movie. I, I love Midsommar, but it was shot in Hungary. So it's not it, right. so 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 there's not been that sort of international horror movies that really shows what it looks like. Right. And there's also this sense of disconnect from the real landscape of, you know, Scandinavia, the Finno-Ugaric tongue, you know, the whole thing. Like there's not enough that really concentrates on that area. So I'm excited. And we are really weird. We are really weird. Hey. I mean, we're, we're, we're good kind of weird, but we're weird. I mean, nobody knows where we come from. We have no relationship to either of our neighbors. I know. We're not we're, we're not linked to the Swedes. We're not linked to the Russians. Our language is by very many generations Finno-Hungarian, which is weird because if you go to Hungary, it doesn't sound anything like us. We no. just don't. We, you wouldn't even notice the roots. And yeah, and there's a there's a sense of like, OK, we were just a, a, we were just dropped there. Like, you know, we, we, we didn't we were just dropped there and we we kind of um it's it's interesting that our roots are different to, to you know because a lot of our neighbors share roots together mm -hmm. you know but um and that's why actually you know we we're, we're um because we're not technically uh, scandinavians we're 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 nordic that's true, that's um, true. And, I, and so I'm sorry i misspoke i apologize oh no 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 quite the opposite you know i mean we are very often even Finns just talk to talk about Scandinavia, including us, but in the origins, we're not. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and it's true. It's it's a funny thing. It's like it's uh, it is a, it is. And and you know what? When I moved to Los Angeles uh, from London, and uh, I tend to tell people that I'm Finnish rather than telling them I'm French because there's a lot of French people here. Whereas Finnish Finnish is a weird one. People yeah. are literally asking me, "So what's Finland?" <laughs> it's a better conversation starter, right? So we haven't offended that many people yet. That's good. Whereas, whereas us French, we just... <laughs> well, that's a whole other question. Everybody has an opinion about French people. It's true. It's true. Everybody I get to have an opinion about French people and Finnish people because I'm both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that's the way to be. And in terms of looking at, you know, kind of the reception in other countries when you've gone around with Sound of Violence, I just was curious if you've seen a differential reception in different countries. Uh, yes, I mean, um, I'll say that um, I was absolutely blown away by the response we got in the UK. Hmm. The UK, you know, you come out of a festival like South by Southwest with with a lot of um, of uh, with a horror film. You expect to come out with a sort of you're hoping for a mixed positive. Uh, response which is what we got we got a mixed positive we got you know I, we got uh, a, a, a majority of people seem to like it but there was still a fair bit it's a very divisive movie as well so it's like it's always going to yes. anger some people while while please a, 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 a few others um and i love both as long as i'm ne never forgettable i'm very happy with both yeah but in the uk and you know i built my whole career in the uk i built my my company in the uk my kids were born in london i you know um and and so it was a homecoming and it also was the first festival fright fest where i could be there in person mm -hmm. and it was incredible the every review that came out was positive even the guardian who are you know is 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 not really known to like horror gave it three stars which is <laughs> in their scale that's like that's a five star anywhere else um and you know and we got absolutely amazing response from 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 so many of the the outlets and it was it was just it was our first festival in person on the circuit and then on top of that it was just overwhelming love and i just you know coming home because London is a home for me. I lived 14 years there. And as I said, I built everything there. 
I was so emotional. I cried like like you wouldn't believe it during the, the Q and A. I'm not cried. I, I had tears. I was very tearful during the Q and A. First of all, I say you cried. It's okay. No, no, but it, it just I was. I managed to answer the question, but I was very. I was just holding. I was. I had tears running down my face completely. I was frankly watching it on. They, they put it up on an IMAX screen, mm. so it was like it was bigger than life. That's and my cool. film is not an IMAX movie, but it was just you know. So I was there seeing all the when the first synesthesia hit it was like oh i was just i was just so happy i was just happy um and then after the first murder i i had i, I saw four people walking out and See, i was that like is where the you going? Sign. that is <laughs> yeah. the sign of an excellent film though or at least a film that no one can claim that they are apathetic about, which is the worst thing, right? Absolutely. And I I, I was like, I, I saw them walk out and it was like, and part of my mind was like, where are you going? Another part. Uh-huh. 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 I see what I did there. And then at the end though, when the lights came on, the, the place was still full. People stayed for the Q&A as well. You know, during the Q&A, you always have like a good third to half that just go. But you know, a lot of people stayed and we had some amazing questions. And I had set out a challenge for anybody to find the the the, the chopping mall yeah. um, Easter yeah. egg, which I had no one found it yet. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Have I hidden it too much? Um, but I thought now it's on this giant screen. There's no way they're going to miss it. And it, it was true. They found it. They found it. And I got to give uh, a couple of Blu-rays out. And, uh, and you know, and again, like the, the welcoming part um, was, I could just keep on going about this. I had such a good time. But frankly, um, our whole circuit, has been very positive um again so and by positive i means that we had don't we we never left a place where nobody noticed us Mm -hmm. and again it's a divisive movie some people do not like the sort of surrealist side of this film you know they try to ground it into into things some people also don't understand things that happen on screen that happens um but the fact is, again, I'd rather somebody gets very angry at me than rather than, than just go, huh, that was OK. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's interesting because um, I'm here in New York right now and I went to a and a with Julia Ducournau about Titan. And oh, when, I went, when I went to see the film and I had the Q&A afterward, it was interesting. Like people had queued for hours to get into the screening. And then there were like six walkouts, you know when within the first 10 minutes or so so something like that and you know she kind of was like yeah they're allowed to have their opinion i have my opinion on movies i walk out of movies but but ultimately like the thing that matters most is that people care Mm -hmm. that people are not just sitting and watching passively but that people are actively engaging with what you are saying as a yeah but you know the 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 thing is again Causing a reaction, a human reaction. That's what you do with any piece of art you put out into the world. This is why it's also so daunting because you're, you're, you know, we know that like as, as artists, we, we put things into the world with a, with a, with, with a please love me attitude. <laughs> but at the same time, we are perfect. Like, you know, experience gives us the opportunity to understand that once in a while, we're not going to be liked. And that's good. That's actually fine. In fact, um, the people I angered with this film are absolutely as important as the people I pleased. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, it feels good that, yes, we are at 69% on Rotten Tomato. And it seems that we have, a, a, a you know, again, a, a majority of people seem to like it. But I've actually just really kept an eye and I, I've actually read some of the really angry ones. And um, some of them I'm giddy with because I'm like, how did you end it? You know, but some of them are, you know, there's some really, really sensible one. And I actually think that critique is important. Critique allows us to um, to see things differently. The same way as like um, I was uh, on a panel in, uh, in Louisiana now at the Film Prize. And I was, you know, the, the ability to take notes, sometimes notes that hurt make us better artists. So once in a while, taking critic that might seem silly or how did they not get that? How did blah, 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 blah. It feels good. It sharpens us. It keeps us on our toes. And, um, and, and it's, you know, in, we are, we are in, in horror, we are mad scientists. So if we are not experimental, 
then yeah, we of course we can do palate cleanser movies that everybody seems to love, and it's like it's it's amazing. But but generally, generally, it's horror movies are. I mean, look at the the the, the Rotten Tomato ratings of most horror movies. Yeah, it's insane. It's yeah. just like when you do a horror movie that is above fifty, you've won. <laughs> it's like it's true. It's true. <laughs> It's like 14 to 35% seems to be the sweet spot for most horror films on Rotten Tomatoes. And, and it's like the same. It's, you know. Yeah, and I, you, the, you cannot judge horror movies by by their by m- most of their ratings often like uh, you know. Um I mean obviously yes, it helped a lot. It helps a lot that we're at 69. It's amazing. I'm I never saw it coming. But you know whether it is the like I should see that on IMDb, which is notorious to have like the angry people, yeah. a lot of trolls as well. But like the you know actually the funniest review for uh, Conductor the short it was before it came out. Somebody says this is not a bad train. It's one star. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that one I would print out and frame and put on my wall if I were. Oh uh, yeah, I I I I have it. I, I it was. <laughs> It was on the poster, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I mean, on IMDb, somebody says I should be on a terror watch list for Sound of Violence. Mm-hmm. You know, this movie is everything that is wrong with the world. You're glorifying psychos, blah, 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 anger, anger, anger. And it's just like, it's, you know, you, you have a lot of that in a lot of those rating platforms. People are, there's, there's, it's a historical um, challenging genre. Um, I saw uh, my friend Anik Manet, who who at uh, who um, at during Fantastic Fest says that genre is not a niche, and I absolutely agree with her. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she 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 is absolutely right there. It's not a niche. We are very much a a big genre. We are we are key part of the market. We might not be recognized in many of the big awards, but we are we are where the math scientists go, and we are where the research and development happens. And what we achieve generally benefits. Uh, many other genres down the lines, but um, but in the thing with taking with experimentation, we take risks, and with risks, we can't please everybody. Yeah, but it's also in that risk taking and the heightened emotions of the horror genre that I feel people often undersell the fact that horror cinema is raw cinema. It is cinema in its purest form in many ways. Mm-hmm. And particularly when you look at Sound of Violence, for example, um, kind of the the raw power of the scares and the empathy that you feel toward a serial killer of all people, you know, is what makes you know the cinematic form so powerful. And so it's it's really fascinating to kind of watch that in your work. I'm just thank you. I mean, just what you're saying is, is music to my ears, pun intended. Um, it's it's just, you know, I put, see, because I, I didn't, I don't set out the movie to tell people to sympathize with, with Alexis. I don't need them to emphasize. I'm, I'm just asking them not to rule it out. Mm-hmm. To really, and I often said, the best way to watch Sound of Violence is read nothing, check nothing, take the handbrake off and let her take you along to her journey. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very sorry for the people who said that, by the way, that, sh- that it's not realistic. I'm like, it's not, it's surrealistic. <laughs> the whole thing is about to be an, uh, an exacerbation of a reality to its worst outcome. And I was like, it's not, it's not a plug and play, but, um, but the fact is, um, I decided to commit to a, a character I, I almost hate saying I created Alexis. I, Alexis is, so, is a character that matters so much to me that, that when I, I met Jasmine and she cared so much about Alexis already after reading the script and she, I felt I had met Alexis. So by that moment, that, you know, that, that idea of my, of my monster was not there anymore. It's like, this, okay, I've met Alexis now. And now the, the the collaborative journey to bring it um, as authentically and 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 passionately as we could, and this amazing collaboration that Jasmine and I had to bring her to screen and to give her um, a very a very conflictual charisma, if that makes sense. Meaning that our audience has to they have to go through watching everything that she has on offer. And 
and constantly wonder what is wrong with themselves for being able to care. And so, you know, like I, I say, I say the, you know, oh, how does it feel when you catch yourself tapping to the music? How does it feel to sympathize with her human journey when she, and this is not a spoiler, but she, when she hears that she might lose her hearing again, how do you feel when I take the sound away from you? And this is also the important of the sound mix to make sure that the audience and Alexis hear the same thing. When I take the sound away and it feels suffocating, the movie starts without sound and people generally check there's something wrong with my system. It's just, it's, it's the, the, the journey of, of I wanted to give and staying with the killer rather than being waiting for the killer was about actually the experiment, the human experimentation of an artist, a, 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 a tormented artist who, who has nothing to lose if her hearing were to go again. And it's that incredible subjectivity that you have in the filmmaking process in this film that I think also makes it uh, so powerful for the audience as a whole. Um, you. you talk about the very opening of the film, and I, I know we talked about this before, but you know, I, I told you before that I was completely bowled over by the way that uh, you even got the sight lines right in terms of the communication in American Sign Language uh, between the family, um, the way that communication happens throughout the film, whether it's through you know, sign language, whether it's through speech, whether it's through music, is so seamlessly interwoven with your point of view as a filmmaker. Um, and it, it, it really is, rather impressive how you achieved that subjectivity. Was that a fight you had to have? I'm just curious if, if you had to defend that vision. Well, first of all, a lot of that, a lot of the, what you're talking about is the part that I, I you know, I'm really, you know, I, I enjoyed the process of researching. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed putting myself, exposing myself to various parts of the story that I am not the right person to tell because I have no firsthand experience of, you know, um, whether it is on the disability side or the fact that this is a story of a queer black woman. I had to therefore, from the development part onwards, consider this project as an open question on my, on my behalf. And everywhere I could go to being met with, with understanding and knowledge, I could then build a sort of as authentic as I can possibly try to be without ever considering I necessarily did all the way, but I, I just wanted to. So when it came to, for example, um, the American Sign Language, we obviously it, we 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 had to understand first the big difference between deafness and loss of hearing. Mm -hmm. We never used the word deaf in the movie because she experienced loss of hearing and regained her hearing and is about to less to lose it again. Um, and so again, that meant, okay, what does that mean in terms of our sound language? Where do we go with that? And I, I reached out to, to, to relevant uh, consultants who told us that she would be clumsy with sign language. She would speak at the same time because speaking is still was, was definitely her first. Um, and the same thing is like the, the conversation with her mom has to feel awkward because they, they have something that they, that they, that they, both have that they don't have anymore and that kind of makes the conversation between them um slightly disconnected so all those so that's the the, the part of, of the uh, uh, of what you were describing where where i just like i just wanted to make sure that we that we were as authentic as we could and you know the same thing as, a, as i mentioned the character of a queer black woman the fact that jasmine is a queer black actress allowed her to then bring me the, her truth and bring the truth to alexis so that her truth was uh, believable and authentic. Yeah. Um, as far as the subjectivity and, and the eye of the audience onto all that, all I could worry myself with was less what they saw or what they thought they saw and more about how much of the information am I putting in front of them so that they can actually rationally think about what they're seeing. Um, so in a nutshell, it was an absolutely immense challenge, and I loved every minute of building it mm. because I got to interact with people and I got to show them my story, the story that I wrote, and 
receive receiving you know in because you know re, the research process i was giving them the relevant parts of the story that 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 allows them to to tell me what to what to do and their response just like yours the first time we spoke meant everything to me and because then, oh sorry go ahead no just saying just because because after that the drama the story the craziness the the horror all the all the the the, the, the fictional part everything was revolving around a core and that's the core that I, that, that that I wanted to make sure we got right so that then the the eye of the audience although people still question things that they don't understand um you know people project what they see and and people you know and then blame me for it but that's that's a different story but the dra- the dr- drama part on if I could get that core right then I feel that I could focus on the performance around the drama and, and build something that was a little bit more immersive yeah and, and speaking as someone who is hard of hearing, for those in the ghouls audience who don't necessarily know that, I found the, the entrance to the film incredibly grounding um, in that it not only, as I mentioned before, really gives you a sense of what that experience is really like, but it also grounds you in sort of this family story and the idea of Alexis's childhood and who she is as a person from the very start. And it's it's really incredible to me how you managed to make that work um, on such a very visceral level. And like I say, being hard of hearing myself, like I, I 100% identify with exactly how things are shaking out. But even if you don't have that experience, I feel like there is something super specific that also makes it much more universal and much more you. Uh, relatable, I think, for the audience. I, 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 you know, just hearing that makes me happy because it, it was a big, it, it, I mean, we discussed this many times, you and I, and I, and you know how important it was for me. And then, um, yeah, I I did my yeah. my my damn best you to did. to try you to did. get to to, to to get it right because it's a it matters it matters because you know what it is it is a crazy thing that there are so many things that you know even in the development of this film I was being told why 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 that person why this person why this trait this identity trait versus another um, and I stood by the story that I that that came up in my head and the character that 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 I created because. Because why not? Mm-hmm. Why why is it why is it if we if we go about the right way, ask the question and keep an open mind to have people meeting us the rest of the way to give to bring authenticity and in, in, in a diversity of characters that 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 doesn't get enough um, limelight. It, it just the, the process is that the the conversation is often about like no you're not allowed to talk about it. So no no you're not allowed to project. We're not. Al- I'm not allowed to tell people what it is like when I don't know what it's like. Yeah. I and if I'm going to take on that challenge, all I feel is a responsibility. Yeah. And if you and go I, into it with with this feeling of being humble and having the humility and the grace to accept the things that you don't know already as a filmmaker, and you go into it with the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of learning what that experience is actually like you suddenly are not dealing with diversity like it's so many check boxes. I mean, that's the thing that I, I find really frustrating about the, the film industry as a whole is that very often when you see uh, films that feature queer, black, female leads with a disability, almost all the time, it's because someone said, oh, for funding, you have to have X, Y, Z. Whereas in your story, What I really appreciate is that all of those things inform who she is, and it is obvious that you took the time and the care to build the world by consulting people who have that experience, who live that experience. And I I feel like that's one thing that this film does extraordinarily well. And I, I do point it out to other people for that very feature. Even if people object to the content, I feel like just the idea of building diversity as yourself, a white man, it can be done and it can be done thoughtfully. And this film certainly proves that point. I think it's, a, it, it, you know, again, I'm, I'm also the father of two daughters 
And, um, and, you know, if I, if I, for example, female representation in my film is, is wrong, they'll be mad at me. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother will be mad at me. My wife will be mad at me. So I'm, I'm also just, I'm being kept on my toes in my private life as well as <laughs> on my, in my work. And I actually, it's one of those things that, um, I find, I find it exciting. Yeah. I find it exciting to have a duty of care, a sense of responsibility to research and to deliver something that, you know, I'm not saying that every story I'm going to write is necessarily going to have this sort of this level of intricacy as far as research and, and building. A, but, but if it has for the sake of a story that I really believe in, I'll go through whatever hoops and, you know, research whatever I need to research in order to get it right. Because I think it would have, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very proud of this story. And I think the, um, the biggest disservice I would have ever done to it. If I, if people believe that there's no such thing as a selfless good deed, then here's, here's a very selfish part of, of, uh, of doing this research. I wanted to, to, I wanted it to make my story better. Mm -hmm. If, if I got it wrong, it makes it, it disservice to my story. So it doesn't matter what intention people project onto me. The fact is, is like, it doesn't matter what, which perspective we look at. It is, it is a matter of not just integrity, but it's a matter of responsibility to get it right for the sake of the people and the story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a wonderful note to leave this conversation on because it's just so excellent what you managed to do in order to further your story. And it really is an incredible work with just absolutely stunning visuals and sound. And I wanna thank you so much for your time, Alex. Thank you, Ariel. It's always a pleasure.